Great. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our Immerse UK panel. Um, my name is Asha Easton. Um, I'm the head of Immerse UK, and I'm joined by some incredible speakers today who are going to be talking about um, the current state of the out-of-home uh, entertainment space. Um, as we all know, it's been a bit of a tricky last few months, and so I'm very excited to hear um, all of your perspectives on on um, where we're at at the moment and and where things are going. So we're going to have Kevin Mo uh, Williams from KWP Limited uh, moderating the panel, and we are also joined by Joanna Popper, who is HP's global head of VR for location-based entertainment, Simon Revely um, from Figment Productions, Life Peterson from Hollowgate, and Steve Tagger from Endreams. So I'll turn it over to Kevin, and you can take it away. Thank you very much, Asha. Appreciate it. And I would like to thank uh, everyone at Immerse UK at the front and the back end of the process uh, for allowing us to uh, hold this session and to gather such an important group of individuals. I really do appreciate your time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for doing this. It is an important part, as was said, in our industry's history. Just before the pandemic, uh, we were uh, right in the midst of it with immersive entertainment and location-based entertainment really getting crowded and confusing and then the gods changed everything and turned everything on its head and so now we are at this point of emerging we are emerging from uh, a, a global lockdown and the industry is now looking towards how it's going to move forward uh, and the issues that are going to shape it uh, uh, all of our speakers are going to give a, uh, a brief rundown of the, the key points that make them a company and what their direction is in the market and then we're going to go for some questions and as has been said if uh, any of our audience would like uh, to give some questions uh, we'll be glad to take them uh, during the course of the, the presentation but allow me to steal your time a little bit and to try and uh, explain a little bit of what we do at KWP and uh, where we see the industry going at this point in time. Uh, KWP is a specialist consultancy that uh, looks at immersive entertainment across the whole of the outer home entertainment market. When we say outer home, uh, some people call that the enterprise entertainment sector, some people call that the commercial entertainment sector. Fundamentally, what we're talking about is pay for play, uh, theme park attractions, amusement, VR arcades, location-based entertainment, as well as the new uh, vantage points for commercial entertainment, such as uh, retail attainment such as its deployment in esports, such as uh, the applications in museums and heritage in edutainment. Uh, the problem really is that it's such a wide and broad canvas that it is difficult for some people who are fixated on the consumer side of uh, uh, the entertainment bandwagon to really get a handle on. And this is a complicated and tricky market, but also it's a market that offers a lot of opportunity. Um, we touch the coalface is a phrase that uh, is sometimes used. And what we mean by the coalface is that we have direct access to the players that come to our facilities and we shape them with game entertainment experiences, which they pay to play. Uh, that is where the fundamentals of our industry come from. But enough about uh, the general picture. I think it's important that you uh, hear from the people that are actually shaping the market and are actually developing the technology that is being deployed into this sector. So if I may, Joanna, could I turn to you and have a rundown really of where HP is at this point in time? Sure, thanks Kevin, and thanks Asha and everyone for setting this up. It's great to be here this, this early morning where I am. And so, hi, my name is Joanna Popper. I'm with HP. I've been at HP about two and a half years. And prior to that, I was at NBC Universal for nearly a decade. And I was at a tech company in Silicon Valley for a bit. And HP has been highly focused on this sector for a long time. It, this is actually our 81st anniversary with HP. And our first customer, our very first customer was Walt Disney. And he was working together with the two founders of HP in the garage in Palo Alto, which has subsequently been credited with being the founding of Silicon Valley. They were working on technology for the movie Fantasia. So we have a long and storied history in both technology, computing, 
and entertainment. And so our, our focus on virtual reality came into being about, uh, I would say about three or so years ago, uh, where you know, HP has continuously in these 81 years been focused on the future of computing and in being, being uh, really creating what that future of computing is gonna, going to be. And so HP sees that it's incredibly important for us to be leading and, and innovating in and around the immersive computing space. So I have been focused on our relationships and our, our, our you know, building our business and working with so many great partners like the ones on, on this panel and many, many I'm sure in the audience and, and around the world to build out the business in location-based entertainment. And so um, we have we have been, you know, we've been open for business and, you know, we don't, we, all of our technology is available to be used in location-based entertainment. I get that, I get that question a lot, you know, are there special licenses, are there special, you know, something special you need? No, um, you know, all of the tech, the tech that we, that we create is available to be used in whatever environment you choose, whether that's at home to play some great games, like some of the games that, that's, you know, some of the panelists will talk about or in a location-based venue. Um, we've launched at this point three different VR backpacks. You can see one behind me is the latest uh, VR backpack generation two. It has a 2080 inside. Um, you can wear it, you can, you can use it docked like I am right here. So it's um, you know, to design and create and, and develop, or you can put it on your back and use it for free roam, which many of the, many of the VR um, arcades and, and location-based entertainment players are, are doing. And we've launched three different headsets. Our latest headset that we announced is, called, is the HP Reverb Generation 2. We just announced it. It's a partnership with Valve and Microsoft. So we are thrilled to be working with this trifecta of amazing technology companies. Um, it's super high resolution. It has a lot of what the Reverb G1 had to offer in terms of resolution and much, much more and better. And you know, all the, all the things that we heard from location-based entertainment, like, can you add manual IPD? Could you fix the cable? Can you improve the optics? You know, can you, can you give, uh, give us some better audio? All of that's in there too. So we've been working, partnering, working closely. And then of course we have laptops and desktops and all of that. So we've been working with location-based entertainment players all around the world from the US to China, to Dubai, to you know, all of Europe, um, Japan, Korea. We have, we are, we're working really closely with different companies. And so a great vantage point to seeing what's, what's been happening, how, how companies are, are uh, dealing and with this unprecedented times, you know, some of the strategies that they're taking on, and you know what's what's coming next. Thank you very much, Joanna, for that. Appreciate it. And also, uh, can I also personally thank you for having to get up so early to attend this session? I, sure. We, we, all, we all appreciate it, and uh, what HP is doing in the market is very, very f fundamental to our futures, as it were. Well, moving on, uh, I'd like to get uh, Simon from Figment to give us a little bit more of an overview from the, the theme park, as well as uh, your involvement in location-based entertainment. Over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so um, I'm Simon Reveley from Figment Productions. We've been in existence for just over 10 years, um, and we've been working with VR Actually, I've been working with VR for longer than that. So um, the first big VR project that I did was for the British Army. It was a 72 stage road show where we used acoustic tracking systems. And we essentially used a, a kind of a cave environment using projection. Um, uh, it's a pretty unique project. That led on to more interest working with game engines and VR. And then um, we got hold of the initial Oculus prototypes and uh, pretty quickly got ourselves involved in an incredibly ambitious project at a UK theme park um, and that soon led on to a second one. So we did two pretty um, groundbreaking projects simultaneously. One was called Galactica at Alton Towers in the, um, in the UK and the other was called Derren Brown's Ghost Train at Thorpe Park in the UK. Um, so for Galactica we developed our own uh, motion synchronization system that used um, inertial measurement units and other sensors that were built onto the roller coaster itself. So this is a real roller coaster. And we had um, eight, 84 headsets that were physically attached to the coaster. Um, we made custom battery packs. We built the electronics ourselves. We wrote the software ourselves and we made the content ourselves. So at heart, we are a media production company. 
but we have some pretty unusual technical capabilities. So we brought those to bear on those projects. Um, simultaneously that we were delivering that, we were also doing the ghost train. And the ghost train, um, we got the first two 200 Vive Pre's off the production line, and um, we fitted them into three London Underground tube carriages. And so that gave us 173 headsets that were all live simultaneously. And uh, that's on moving train carriages full of people, all of them with headsets on. So um, both of those projects were slightly ahead of their time, very ambitious projects. They opened in um, 2016 or 2017. Uh, I can't remember now, several years ago. And, and then off the back of those, we did some more roller coaster projects. Um, so in total, we've had nearly 5 million people go through our VR experiences in theme parks. Some of those rides have, have been and gone already, and some of them are still operating, or at least they would be if the world hadn't changed. Um, so we've got some pretty interesting learnings from those projects. Um, and some of them are around operational stuff, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But what I would say is that those rides would achieve a throughput of around 11 to 1200 people an hour when they were running at full tilt. So um, to get well over a thousand people through an experience every hour is quite a thing. Um, and it requires a very specific sort of discipline in the operational team more than anything else. And um, what we discovered from working hand in glove with the parks is that in order to achieve those kind of numbers of, of throughput, when you're cleaning VR headsets, um, there's a massive overhead on the staff numbers that are required. So um, on one of the roller coasters, um, you would normally be able to get maybe four members of staff achieving those numbers. Uh, with VR, you needed to have more like 16 uh, members of staff. So a massive overhead in terms of the operational um, requirements. And that's really where the theme park sector has struggled to establish VR properly. Um, there are other approaches to it. So for instance, our good friends at VR Coaster, who we, um, who we work with and know well, they have a very diff different system where you, you take a headset onto the ride with you. Um, and therefore the, the numbers of people experiencing VR tend to be quite a bit lower, but, um, but it doesn't have the same operational overhead on, on the team and therefore the costs are a lot lower. So anyway, we did several of those um, theme park level projects where you're having you know, up to just over a thousand people an hour go through the ride. But we also absolutely fell in love with free roaming VR. So we spent a couple of years developing our own um, free roam platform called Helix where we use photorealistic avatars. So we scan people before they go into the experience and then you become embodied with your own personalized avatar. And we were initially targeting that towards the, the, the sort of the world of, of your, of your um, you know, the void, zero latency, dreamscape, all of that, that world of large scale free roaming VR. Um, and in fact, we have an, an Innovate UK government backed project that we're doing at the moment with the Royal Opera House. Um, which is going to be released later this year using the wonderful HP ZVR backpack and HP Reverb headset, Joe. Um, and that's still going ahead at the moment. But what we're finding now is that we are absolutely in the thick of lots of questions about where, where the future of location-based VR is, particularly over the next six to 12 months. So um, I'm beginning to find that nearly every project we do that is targeting location-based is tending to be um, specified with a backup plan of also having a remote viewing version as well. And I think for, for most of us on the panel, um, we have both the location-based experience and also content production. And I think that's really important. I think if, you're, if you have your own content, then you've still got a route through to market. So I see my five minutes is up, Kevin. I'm sorry, I've tripped over by 48 seconds, but um, I think that's probably enough from me. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, it's okay. We'll we'll chastise you later for that. Uh, but 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 fascinating. You touched upon uh, the key points, and it is that ability to have uh, both the hardware and the software available that makes it so important uh, to have a rounded uh, presence in this sector. And uh, it also helps if you're really one of the leaders in that sector. And we're lucky enough to have uh, life here from Hollergate, who can uh, give us a, a view from your lofty mansion at the top of the sector, please. Thanks, Kevin. 
So uh, yeah, um, thank you for organizing this and having me on this panel, first of all. Uh, it's good to uh, uh, do something like this. Usually, you know, this is more in person and meeting you guys and at conferences and so as we don't have this, I'm very happy to to have a virtual panels like that. So I think it's a, it's a great incentive. I'm yeah, very happy to join here. And um, yeah, so I mean, for us, uh, Hollowgate is uh, probably currently the, uh, yeah, the market leading and uh, largest, uh, has the largest installation base of any uh, location based uh, VR um, social and multiplayer systems around the world. So we're currently in 35 countries. We have uh, uh, more than 300 systems uh, running live. There's uh, more than 400 sold. So they are about, they still have to be in installed. Um, so of course, uh, everything's come a little bit to a halt, but it's also um, picking up again. And so there's actually some positive numbers that we see uh, because we're kind of uh, all over the world. Uh, you know, we have a, so we have a live view into all the data and what's happening and how many players are playing and so forth. And so currently pre-COVID-19, we did about 5 million uh, people per year also going through our experiences. And so there's um, two systems that we currently, two products <coughs> that, we, uh, that we sell and install worldwide. There's the Hologate Arena, which is basically it's, uh, kind of what you can see in the background in a way. It's a four player system that is fairly small footprint. So you can uh, enjoy and play with it, VR with your family and friends. Um, uh, and so there's a library of games. So we really have something um, for everybody from uh, family friendly uh, cooking games to uh, like uh, defending the zombie apocalypse in the future. Uh, so it's kind of all there. We have a super uh, um, high technology, high fidelity simulator, which is fully tracked, uh, which uh, pretty much reduces the problem that most simulators have uh, with motion sickness. So here, uh, this, this is a really, really uh, great experience. Uh, we introduced that to the market in uh, just last year, November at IAP in Orlando, and a few of you have also experienced the launch and uh, I think like the experience. So uh, and that's, that's the two products. Uh, and so we're thinking in products and there will also be other products in the future for us. Um, so unlike other LBE companies, we are not operators. So we are a, a system integrator, system provider. So we do everything from uh, developing our own content, our own games. We're also publishing content from other third party uh, developers. So we're now working with, yeah, through an SDK basically with other game developers that can publish on our platform. And we do see it as a platform. Uh, so it's a format. So we do see it, uh, everything we create is a platform for content. So like uh, cinemas, uh, you know, basically update their technology over the years and have grown and evolved. So are we, so, uh, you know, we're, we're basically integrating, you know, growing with uh, the headsets and technology and it's getting better and also do the games and the content. And uh, so we very much do believe in this uh, format. And so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, been very successful for, um, you know, many, many of our clients are very happy with this. And this is why it's uh, been growing so fast. And just maybe to touch a little bit uh, on the current situation. So of course, uh, you know, a lot of our systems were closed for about, or pretty much everything was closed for about eight weeks. And so we saw a drop in the player numbers pretty much going to zero uh, very quickly. And then now we're kind of recovering. So currently the whole network is at about 50% uh, of the player numbers that we had before, but it doesn't mean that all the systems are running at 50%, 50%, it, a lot of them are not open, right? And so the interesting thing is we have some operators that now actually tell us and I think I, it's, it's hard to find the relation uh, like where is it or where is it not. But for example, we have an operator in New Zealand that just reported they're busier than before and we're looking at the numbers and they have more people playing. So which is for me a huge relief and I think for the whole industry that people uh, actually don't mind uh, putting on headsets. There will be a certain percentage of germophobes that won't do this and they might be lost to this industry forever. And this is also what a lot of other operators and uh, clients and partners see. And I've been in a lot of discussion with uh, industry partners as well. And so uh, it's like there might be some people that uh, will be very uh, troubled to come back. There uh, will be uh, 
early adopters kind of that don't mind. And then you have to uh, get uh, the huge uh, mass of people uh, to, uh, to uh, basically assure them that hygiene and safety measures have been taken so that the systems are clean. And it also has to be shown. It's very important that now it's being shown that things are being cleaned. And then people also like to come back. And so the, the numbers we're seeing currently with locations that are open are in, generally, in general very promising. So it, I think it's going to be a bump. And uh, of course, no one knows how long this will take, but uh, it will recover. So that's, that's our uh, viewpoint currently. Thank you very much, Life. Yes, the people forget that uh, there are other countries that are opening and uh, that they've already started their VR uh, business. We, uh, we're dealing with uh, clients in Australia and New Zealand, but also in certain of the states of America and Europe that have now operating their amusement and VR facilities. And thankfully, touch wood, uh, we're seeing that the audience is still hungry for this unique entertainment. So to our final uh, panelist, uh, may I first say, Steve, congratulations on a launch. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Brilliant. It's, uh, yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's going well so far. I'm uh, very happy with it. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about this and also uh, uh, explain a little bit about your movement into uh, location-based entertainment, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Asha, and, and thank you for kind of including me on this, uh, this great panel. Lots of familiar faces um, that normally we'd be kind of seeing at different spots around the world. Um, so, I mean, I'm the business development director at um, End Dreams. Um, I've been in video games and kind of gaming content for over 20 years. Um, it's mainly the last three years I've been with Endreams. And for those that don't know Endreams, we're a leading VR um, developer and publisher. Um, we are a content creator and we were formed in 2006 um, where we were the largest um, developer and publisher on PlayStation Home. I don't know how many people will remember PlayStation Home. Um, but then in 2013, we fell in love with VR. Patrick, um, our CEO, was really passionate about it. And we pivoted and have been fully focused on that ever since. Um, we're growing. Um, we've been growing quite a bit over the years. And we're currently at um, 110 people. And we've launched 10 VR experiences across the home consumer and the LBE markets. Um, we, we work with lots of different partners from um, first party um, to kind of LBE operators, things like that. We work with kind of mom and pop arcades, the platforms, um, IP holders. Um, I mean, in terms of the out of home market, um, on the arcade side, we brought Shooty Fruity, which was um, originally a home consumer game. It was like a four or five hour um, game. Um, which was uh, when it launched the highest rated shooter on PSVR. Um, and then we brought, we brought that to, to the arcades. And what we did, again, we're very kind of content focused. And what we did when we did that was we squeezed it from a four hour game down into a 10 minute um, snackable session based game. And we did a lot of research into the market. So we, we take LB very seriously. We did a lot of research. We did a 12 month piece exploring the market, understanding what the platforms wanted, the operators wanted, the attendees, the attendants wanted and the attendees the customers wanted. We were very careful about and, and consider very carefully kind of when we kind of look at markets to understand them properly. Um, we've also done an out of home um, balloon ride experience, which was a 4D um, experience where you got into a physical basket and you had kind of heat from the, the burner above you and winds as you went through this perfect, well, it was called perfect balloon flight. So you went through this perfect kind of nighttime um, balloon um, experience. And that was designed again as a very kind of passive experience um, for people who were kind of new to VR. Um, and then really you've kind of touched upon it last week, we launched Phantom Covert Ops, which um, you can see just behind. Um, that's an action stealth kayaking game um, on the Quest and the Rift. Um, we've done that with Oculus Studios. Um, it's, you know, we're really, really proud of it. In 2019, um, it won the uh, E3 Game Critics Award for the best VR and AR game. Um, and obviously last week it launched and it launched on Quest and Rift and it's cross play save and buy so you buy the rift you get the quest the quest version as well 
Um, and it's uh, it was number one on Rift and it's number two on Quest just behind Beat Saber. Um, and the player reviews are really, really positive. So um, at the moment, we're yeah, we're very happy. And rightly so. Launching a product uh, in interesting times is always difficult, but uh, it's it's important to uh, see that uh, you know the the market is still hot and hungry for uh, consumer VR, and from the information that we have, we're seeing that also being replicated with I LBE. Think, I think that's. I think it was testament to kind of Patrick and the team in terms of kind of we recognised um, early the the kind of issues that the pandemic would create. And so we worked really hard at getting the team um, working remotely really early. So, yeah, I mean, we're really proud of the fact that we've, we've delivered um, Phantom Covert Ops um, for the last four months being um, with the backdrop of the pandemic. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard work, but, yeah, it's worth it. And, um, you know, it's important for me to say uh, to everybody who's watching and listening to this, uh, we hope that they're well and they're safe. Uh, and we all understand that we're working in trying times. And those trying times really uh, get us to think a little bit more about the market. Uh, and I suppose one of the nice things about having uh, all of you here, and, and again, thank you for your time, is that you've all handled IP, intellectual property. I come from a background in Disney, uh, but all of you have dealt with uh, intellectual property, but also an interesting point is you've also dealt with uh, content uh, that has been uniquely sourced. And we in the location-based entertainment industry have really been put through the ringer. Not only have we temporarily shut our facilities, but also we're seeing that uh, one of our most popular uh, of the location-based entertainment content, Beat Saber Arcade has been removed from some of uh, the VR arcade market. Can I just get a, a sounding from each one of you, uh, really what you feel about what IP brings to this particular part of the market and what it doesn't? Uh, Joanna? He brings, I think IP, IP can be, oh, I'm muted. I'm no, no, muted? you're fine now. Oh, okay, was, uh, great. I say that I, you know the, the upside of IP, of course, is that it's 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 known content that can drive audiences. So if you're bringing you know Star Wars, Holga, you're bringing uh, Angry Birds. You know if you're bringing if you're bringing in IP that people know and love, then that you know and then bringing them into VR for the first time, it's not taking like two leaps at once to you know two unknowns. You're, so you're so you you know you can use the IP and the connection to Jurassic Park or Star Wars or you know Avengers or any of these as a driving a driving force. On the other hand, um, you know we've seen I we you know we've seen so many so many new IPs break out in in VR and become people's favorites so I think it, you know I, I think it can, it can equally work in both in both ways and the one the one caution I have sometimes about IP is that sometimes when when it's being created it's being created as a sort of corollary or ancillary and it's not being created to really be endemic and native for VR and so I think that's that's why in some cases we've seen new new IP that's really created as you know out of VR and you know by people who are endemic to VR have has taken off and in, in ways that you might not have originally suspected because they're really thinking about you know how wh what are you like the powers of immersion the powers of interactivity the powers of embodiment and using that when they're creating the games from the get go as opposed to trying to adapt something else into vir virtual reality. An, an excellent point. It's uh, some people look at IP as a wrapper, other people see it as a foundation to build upon. Uh, and well, life, you know, you guys have uh, such a wide library of products, but uh, you know, you have the some of the most recognizable IP, but also you have some home uh, brew. How do you uh, make the decision of what is the right fit for what you need? Yeah, I mean, so uh... First of all, of course, we're content creators and developers, and so I have a huge background in uh, in content, and so I, I, I worked in in, this industry, uh, in yeah basically the, let's say the digital content creation industry for all my life, and so um, I think uh, in terms when it comes to product or selling things, of course, IP is great in a way that you know people recognize it and there's a lot of brand value to this and so forth. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, if you look at it from a business perspective. Uh, IP always comes at a cost, and so um, 
now it's a, it's a, what, the, what the real problem is when you are a startup and you're trying to build something new uh, you, how do you finance something like that and also if you look at ip and you especially you want to work with for example something like big hollywood ip the expectations of course from uh, uh, licensors uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes out of this world and you can't just fulfill it and this will uh, also <clears throat> if, if 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 the expectations are too high and you will try and meet them uh, this might actually cause your uh, company to potentially be at risk if if you're paying too much for for IP, let's say, right? So um, I think uh, that's 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 kind of the the difficult part about it. So you need to balance uh, how do you find a deal that is uh, working for all parties involved, right? And so um, I mean we're working here. We have with uh, we work with Sony and Rovio on integrating. Um, uh, a Hollowgate Angry Birds experience when the movie came out uh, last year. And so it's been a huge success, um, basically. And uh, I think uh, so, especially um, it's, 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 I think it's uh, IP can help to uh, promote certain things, but it's not, it's not a must. And I think like we're creating our own IP and our own games as well. And uh, of course, uh, creating IP for a studio is also very valuable because at the end, then you are the owner of the IP, right? So maybe you create something that is the next Angry Birds, but who knows? And even Angry Birds, I mean, it was something like what the 62nd or 63rd game of Rovio almost before they stopped making anything and almost failed, right? So I guess you, you know, sometimes you're lucky and it's a one hit wonder and then Sometimes you have to go to through 63 iterations of different games to actually find this one special piece of IP that uh, people really love. So um, I think it's in general, that's how we see it. I think it's great to uh, create your own IP uh, if you can, and also to work with uh, uh, existing IP because uh, it, it, it's just so great for people to actually come and, and, and that, so that they can experience something that they already know and there's value for our clients in it as well. And so I think you have to strike a fine balance there. I don't think you have to have all IP. I think that there should be a balance. So that's, that's my opinion on this. Yeah. It's always, always a difficult balance to, to achieve. Yes. Uh, and with Rovio, it's the Elon Musk school, isn't it? The, the last project of the last throw of their dice. And it was the, the big one, the big success. But talking about the importance of IP and dealing with really sensitive and really big IPs, you can't get bigger than uh, uh, putting products into the theme park market. And, you know, Simon, how do you, how do you guys feel about it? Because I know that some of the products you work on are IPs, but also innovation is important to you. Yeah, I, I think um, obviously there's a whole world of uh, intricacy around the legal side of working with an IP. Uh, and I can see everyone in the chat is very much interested in the void situation, which has been announced today, which we'll I want to that. Don't worry. Because probably delicate territory. Um, but, you know, apart from the legal side and also the cost as life was referring to, um, I think one of the things people really underestimate with working with an IP. And again, I'm sure life will, will know this from his background is that the cost of production goes through the roof. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So over the years, we've worked with um, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lego, um, and lots of big brands like Coca-Cola, um, ju just lots of kind of really big headline companies and brands and IPs. And the thing that I think people just always underestimate is that because of all the stakeholders involved, you have to go through incredibly difficult stakeholder management and um, review processes. And it just takes something that if you own the IP, you can make a decision in a heartbeat and move forward with the production work, which in VR is complicated anyway, right? But I mean, I remember doing one project, which I shouldn't name, but we had a 12 week review cycle. So if we changed a bit of artwork on a sign in a street, it would take 12 weeks before we got any feedback on it because it went through multiple stakeholders who were involved with that particular IP. So. That was an incredibly challenging um, project. And obviously all of that adds time and therefore it adds lots of money. Um, and also some IPs are incredibly powerful. So the person who's picking up the bill, which it might be a theme park or, or it, you know, in life's case, it might be life, I don't know. Um, but whoever it is that is physically 
uh, putting forward the budget to make this particular piece of content um, can't always control what the IP wants to change. So if the IP is unhappy about something, they can often dictate um, significant changes that are going to cost more time and more money, and it makes it very difficult to manage. So I think often we get hung up on thinking just about the license fee um, and the cost of a license fee, but actually the cost of production can, can outstrip the cost of the license fee. So I think most people's view on this is where is the return on investment? are you going to get enough of a return of investment to make value out of that additional cost on both the license fee and the additional production time? Um, and that, as we all know, that has been tough. Um, again, someone like Holligate has got this fantastic footprint around the world. So, you know, you're at a scale where that, that becomes more realistic. But for a lot of other people, it's, it's questionable whether they're going to get their return on investment, I think. Yeah, that's, I can't agree more to that, Simon, it's, it's exactly what you just described. And so, I mean, we were lucky with uh, Roby and Sony being very cooperative. And I think also our planning that went into this, like locking everything down and making sure, you know, that we're all talking about the same thing beforehand. So pre-production is very important. And of course, that's where our experience with working with also with so many clients before came came handy so we knew how to structure that and I think so at the end then something came out where everybody was happy uh, that was happy you know that had like a million changes and so forth and uh, so th that that's good and then that can help and the funny thing is what you just mentioned at the end is uh, yeah, the size and so the funny thing is I mean so we now have a uh, the largest network currently, but still, I mean, if you look at the cinema industry, for example, you know, the way, uh, the, how much money you can now spend on creating movies uh, uh, is, uh, it's only grown to that scale because there are so many cinemas out there and the industry has grown over, you know, for whatever, a hundred years or for a very long time, right? So, and um, of course, uh, I, I could imagine something like that, uh, you know, happening in the VR space as well. And so I think uh, that the scale is the problem. So that if they're working with IP, if you if you don't have much of a, a footprint, it's, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, because if you only have like two or three or ten locations or something, it's it's going to be very tricky. Yeah. So uh, install, in, install base is always the uh, uh, the important thing. Sorry, Simon, you were going to say. I was just going to say. I think the other thing, apart from the cost of of production and and the ROI issue, is that um there's still a massive, massive knowledge gap between the kind of people who are working in Hollywood, uh, which is in often the kind of IPs we're talking about here, and what can be achieved in VR. Even when you've got top grade hardware, and obviously LBE has the advantage of being able to control the hardware. So whether we've got a 2080 in a, in a ZVR backpack or, or a custom made rig, yes, we can go to, to a certain level. But the problem is that people see things like the Unreal Engine 5 demo that came out recently, which is fantastic, and we're all very excited about it. But that is not what you can do in VR right now. And it's very difficult to, to talk to particularly Hollywood IP holders whose expectations are that you, with the right money, you can achieve Hollywood level visuals. You can't in VR. You know, yeah, there's ways of cheating it. There's, there's some things you can do. Um, and maybe you get lucky with some stylized elements. Obviously, Angry Birds has a particular look, and that, that lends itself really well to VR. But there are situations I've been in where people have wanted to see completely photorealistic actors involved. And we've, we've done it by cheating things here and there, but it's tough. And their expectations are that you can you can basically make Hollywood in a headset, and that's still technically very challenging. So coming over those expectations is is it can be really difficult to just just communicate to people. Managing expectations is always uh, when you when you're dealing with uh, the Hollywood uh, or even the Bollywood uh, side, and uh, of course. Uh, in chat, uh, we uh, our friends from Secret Location and uh, also from Frame Store uh, would be uh, able to uh, explain uh, the uh, the in you know inner sanctum problems of dealing with uh, the mind of the uh, executive producer that wants to get a photorealistic recreation of their movie and uh, transfer it into virtual reality, but. The, the ability to have an IP that you create yourself or the ability to try and uh, inject your IP into uh, the outer home entertainment market. I, I keep on thinking of what you achieved with Shooty Fruity, Steve. Uh, uh, could you just give us a little bit more of uh, uh, what, what really went on with that thought process? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think just to kind of, first of all, kind of repeat or kind of concur with what a lot of people said. I mean, the thing about an IP, if you're bringing in an external IP is it has to add to the experience. There still has to be, certainly in VR, that kind of core mechanic that is fun and you know, inherently social as well. Now that can be a single player game can be inherently sociable, social because it's fun to watch someone play it and you can share that experience with people so you know at the heart of it it's you you know you can't just do that wrapper um because you know that won't deliver that kind of engaging immersive experience it won't deliver the presence it won't deliver the role play that the the kind of consumers and players are going to come out to, to to want to experience i mean to, and that's what we did when we looked at shooty fruity is you know we knew that we had to look at kind of how quickly people got into the game. You know, we had a game that was a five, four or five hour experience at home. Um, you had a kind of staff a, a staff room. So for those who don't know Shooty Fruity, it's, um, uh, it's a wave shooter set in a supermarket. So you have to do, it's got some job simulation kind of elements to it. So you have to kind of scan all the produce um, while shooting off waves of mutant fruit. Um, and it is just as much fun as it sounds when you're explaining it, but it is really fun to watch people play it. But we had, an, we had that experience there where you could take like, noodle around in the staff room for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And we knew people wouldn't, if you're paying um, for a set of a session in VR, you wouldn't hang around and do that. So we need to get people into the experience really quickly. We needed to take this long form experience and put it down into, we broke it into kind of three mini sessions. So with a progression loop, depending on how well you did, we took a lot of our kind of core kind of, gaming experience to add this kind of branching mechanic depending how well you did you went and did different jobs uh, but if you didn't do so well you'd still get a slightly different experience so every time you came back to it you had a different experience gun swapping loadouts things like that were all changed and adapted so it was all a lot more quicker a lot quicker and a lot more intuitive because again as we'd done kind of the research we knew that kind of operators and attendants wanted things where they didn't have to kind of explain everything they literally want to put people in the headsets you know they get it straight away and leave them to it so we, we kind of considered all those things when we put together the design and then we went back and kind of looked at the best way to deliver that to deliver a 10 minute session that people would want to kind of come back and play and it had some retention mechanics in it that were just baked into the gameplay um, so yeah, it's a, you, you can't, you can't fudge it. You do have to kind of look at the design and kind of build things correctly for, for the LBE market. The LBE market, uh, looking at some of the uh, comments in chat, uh, there is still, uh, skepticism, concern that, uh, the industry can return to where it was, uh, we are in interesting times, as many people have said, and the elephant in the room really is putting a head-mounted display on, on your face that has been used by someone previously. Is that something that people are going to want to do? Um, but also, we have to look at the viability of this industry. And we've had, uh, I spent most of this morning dealing with uh, questions regarding the latest development, the latest company to uh, show pain and anguish in uh, these troubled times, the, the news that the void uh, is uh, going to permanently close at least some of its facilities due to uh, situations related to uh, unpaid uh, debt. Uh, we've also seen what's been going on with AMC, and we all know that AMC is associated with a number of location-based entertainment projects. We had the situation, of course, with uh, our friends at Beat Games and Facebook uh, and their decision to pull out uh, of a VR Arcade deployment of their content. And sadly, I can, I can tell you from the work that we're doing with Stinger Report, we have another two stories about companies in this sector pulling out. I personally don't see this as the end of uh, the world. Uh, I actually see this as the culling of the herd. I've been through this kind of process numerous times, though sadly or happily not attached to a pandemic. But uh, we were a meteoric rise location-based entertainment industry, and we're going to have to take some of the licks for that uh, quick rise to success. But I'd like to know from the panelists, the panelists at the sharp end, really what they feel is the future of location-based entertainment, and can it survive in the current conditions? And Joanna, 
you know, as a company that makes these systems, uh, that has to consider uh, the hygiene aspects, that has to consider the ergonomics. What are your feelings about this? Well, I, I don't think that the industry is over. I saw some some doomsday do, doomsday speakers. I, I I I think well, I think I think we're in a, a time of, obviously we're in a time of great uncertainty and it's unprecedented. I think um, you know when we hear from Life and I you know hear from many of the other partners, there are there are places that are starting to reopen and they are seeing good traffic. I think the, the some of these the what, what's uncertain is how long this current situation is going to last and when you know and, and when governments and you know, city regulations are going to allow different places to open but if you and it, it, it's not monolithic around the world there most of us are in two on this panel well no not all of us so not life but i think the rest of us are in countries where our governments have not handled this as, uh, as, as well as some other governments around the world, if we're speaking, speaking frankly, um, based on the numbers and numbers per capita you know, that we see and, and the, 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 the rise in, in cases that we still see. Then we see other countries where you look at the curves and the curves are, are heading down. You see other countries, you know, our, our, H, our HP offices, for example, in the US are all closed. Our Taiwan offices only closed for two weeks. That's it. Two weeks, they were only closed. So it's very, it's very uh, country by country, and even you know, in big countries, it's even it's state by state, city by city, in terms of, you know, when when things are going to be able to open again, and then then and then you see some places going forward and going back. So all of that is, I think, I think. The, a, a lot of it will depend on what happens. How long do we actually remain closed, and you know, um, th that that will all have a big effect. Now, um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to be optimistic about about you know, the pandemic. I'm not optimistic about the pandemic, but optimistic about our the, the response that we'll have, and that some you know, the hopefully more, more countries and more cities will will get the numbers down and, and get, get it back into good shape. But what, from what we've heard from places that have reopened, they do have good numbers, they do have strong numbers. Some of our partners are even continuing to open new venues, which is, which is a sign of positivity. Um, but, and then, and then we, but we, you know, we, see, we, see, we see partners that have strong financing, strong business model, and you know, strong operations that they are, you know, uh, they, they're they're moving forward and they're coming up with new plans around hygiene. They're coming up with new plans around party size. In some cases, they're coming up with new content so that you 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 don't you know that you also feel like you're making you're you're socially distanced even within the content. They're coming up with new ways to turn on new locations. You know even even um, doing that completely remotely because travel has been reduced um, and access from you know country to country has been reduced. So we're seeing that for some for some players. Other players we're seeing that they've that they've um, pivoted towards you know for the time being focused on more at home you know Steve Steve gave gave points like that we've seen a number of companies do that and then we've seen other players that have comp pivoted completely um, you know so if we look at spaces they're now they're now you know building a, a remote collaboration tool which is a sector of VR uh, social VR remote collaboration um, is is, is having strong growth. So they took their existing skill set and they're using it for, for that. Um, and then we've seen other that, you know, we've seen other partners that have actually pivoted in, into be doing rentals for at home. Um, so those are four different different directions that we I've seen some of our partners go in. And then, you know, then there's then there's partners who, you know, are maybe just aren't financially stable enough to get through this time. The governments where they live and the you know banking system where they live is not and the, the landlords are not are not helping. Um, and they they may end up doing something else. So I think there's at least five different scenarios that that I've that I've seen. But um, overall, I'm optimistic. I think that we as as humans we still crave leaving our homes sometimes. <laughs> um, that and that there will that and, and as humans we're innovative and we uh, come up with solutions and we hope we'll get this under control with the help of so many amazing health officials and uh, and as well as as well as the uh, the, the government officials, um, and so you know there will be there will be way a way out. There will be answers, and, and people will want to congregate again. They want to experience the amazing beauty of, of everything that it, we and, and adrenaline of all the of the experiences that, that the content creators are creating. This is this is a social entertainment industry by its very nature, and the one thing that I've seen uh, from the uh, the countries that have uh, come open 
uh, and that are operating, especially Taiwan, Japan, uh, uh, UAE, uh, especially, uh, that stir craziness of people uh, leaving hibernation, as it were. They really want to uh, get back into entertainment and escapism and experiential entertainment in particular, and VR seems to be there for them. But again, you need to approach these problems and these situations and these concerns, valid concerns, uh, with an appropriate uh, premise and an appropriate response. And one of the things I was impressed about life is that uh, Hologate was one of the first companies to come up with a, uh, a standard of how to operate uh, VR systems uh, so we could all get behind and that we could all show to our playing audience uh, that we care about uh, their safety as much as uh, the enjoyment of them playing on our systems. If you could tell us a little bit more about uh, that process. And I'll just quickly say that I dropped that just in the chat, like just before you said it. So oh. it was great timing. So the piece is in there if anyone wants to read it. Go ahead. Thank Leif. you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so um, yeah, we basically, um, it's on our website as well. And it's now also been uh, kind of spread through uh, a few other companies that kind of uh, adopted our, uh, basically, it's a set of rules and best practice that uh, uh, are basically uh, conform to, uh, you know, uh, what also is being um, recommended from officials and so forth. And so essentially it's about probably um, caring about the hygiene uh, part of this. And uh, so of course it's about uh, properly cleaning the equipment after every use. And that is through disinfectant and basically also the option of UVC light. And so both uh, options are very effective and safe. And so uh, in general, Again, I think what's really important, there's two parts to cleaning. One is uh, that you actually have to do it. So you have to uh, protect uh, everyone and the players and, and the operators and so forth. But the other is also it has to be visible, like players uh, and customers have to see it. And uh, so from we, this is uh, what we hear from, uh, from our customers and, and owners is basically that uh, the places that uh, you know a lot of them have done that before and so they were very they they've already been clean and cleaning uh, uh, very uh, prominent and so that people know it and this is also the venues that uh, people now come back to and they say well we didn't change that much we changed a few things but we already cleaned a lot before and people knew that now i think more and more uh, venues are, are taking this uh, much more seriously because they know they have to. It's a kind of hygiene theater. So really to show it what, what's happening. For example, uh, if we take trampoline parks, you know, there's a lot of surfaces. So urban air is now uh, having a break every 30 minutes and they then uh, basically get the cleaners out. They do a little dance, they disinfect everything and they made a show out of it, right? And so uh, Urban Air is also yeah, one of our biggest clients. Uh, they have, uh, I think, more than 100 trampoline parks in the United States. And so uh, this, is, this is a very good approach. Uh, it's making, it's showing it and feeling, making people feel safe as well, right? And, but again, like the, also in our Urban Air installations, the numbers that we're seeing there in terms of players, they are in the, in the, in the centers that opened up they are very much like before. So some are a little lower, some are a little higher. It's also seasonality and so forth involved. So we always see, you know, when people are playing um, more or less. So, but in general, like our numbers in, uh, the, uh, in the locations that opened up, they're looking extremely promising. And so I think it's a bump and no one knows how long, how long the bump might, will be. And that also, uh, again, depends on you know how effective measures are being taken uh, from you know how how the measures uh, you know it's being uh, you know fr from the government but also how serious people take it right and i think people only take it serious if a government takes it serious because otherwise people don't follow and they don't understand so getting into lockdown here so we're based in germany in bavaria they were it was very early it was very strict and uh, so people took it serious and everybody's wearing masks and caring about it. And so if you look at countries like New Zealand, for example, where now it's like almost eradicated, right? There's extremely low numbers and we're seeing operators report, all right, we have more players than before, for example. It definitely shows that it, this is, if you care about hygiene, right? And you promote the hygiene, people will come back and play. Everybody wants to have a social experience together to, uh, you know, experience something with your family and friends. And if, if for, for us, 
like Hologate, it's four people that can en en enjoy uh, playing in, you know, something together and enjoying the time together. It's not a big group and we kind of have social distancing uh, because everybody has their own space in their, in their uh, you know, quadrant where you play together. So it is, it is there. And so that's also why we're not so worried that, uh, you know, um, this is not gonna come back. It will come back. I think it's actually, it's pretty logic that this will come back. There's no question about it. And I mean, Kevin, you mentioned that, yes, there's been bumps before in the history. And personally, I played VR for the first time in 1993. And then in the end of the 90s, this kind of all disappeared. But I think it was for a different reason that it disappeared back then. It was for the reason that the technology wasn't ready. Yes. And uh, so that is because the, the experience was crap, right? So for me, it was fascinating. I loved it so much that it made it my profession, right? And so that's, that's uh, I loved it, right, so much. And, and, but if you think about it, so that was back then in a virtuality system, is they had the resolution of this thing was 320 by 240, right? So it's, 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 it was nothing. So if you know, you know, it's, it's, you can't compare it to uh, the experience you can get today because it's, it's, it really feels real and it gets people immersed and they forget about reality and uh, you're just in there. And so that, uh, that an entertainment, and so that an entertainment form and the outdoor form entertainment uh, uh, has to be there and will be there also in the future. It's just logic. So this is a process and for us now, the market was very overheated. Yeah? So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Kevin also is very good at uh, keeping count of how many people or how many companies have copied us now. Um, so it's, uh, you, can't, you can't fit that in two hands anymore. It's more, uh, you have to use my feet as well and maybe some other hands. But it's a it's, form of flattery. Like. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and we're very happy that we're in this position, right? So we're in, incredibly... Uh, happy about this and, and lucky and also the partnerships and everything we form and so I'm, I'm very 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 thankful for all of that no, and, um, no, no but, but thank go oh, please underline something so, but that's what I just wanted to say so I think the market will now shrink a little bit and so now currently just there's a few things that kind of just topple over but I think essentially at some stage you know, it will emerge. What what is what is it, what is it, right? Well, how does it work? What's the formula? I think we found one formula that does work, and that's why it's so successful. And there might be other formulas. And uh, I think, in that sense, it will grow. It's just a matter of time. So that's how we see it. Thank th thank you for that, life, Joanna. I was going to underline something that life said, which uh, about the, the that VR in some ways is inherently socially distanced. That you know, if you compare in most VR experiences, are you know, either a single user, you know, in a room scale environment, or in a seat environment, or you know, up up to four to six to eight. There aren't that many experiences right now that have throughput that are that much higher than that. And so you're essentially in a, in a small group. And, and as as you know, and if you compare that to concerts, to to cinemas, to just general music in parks that, that yes we are putting something on our face and so it's incredibly important that people see that that is clean and that, that it's being handled appropriately but you are inherently socially distanced and in many cases you're you know sometimes those those uh, group sizes have been ma maybe limited to only being the people that you come with right right now and and uh, that kind of brings me to uh, getting simon to, to give some input here because uh you know i was lucky enough uh when Simon first started uh, to work on this massive VR project that turned into the Darren Brown experience, we were actually seeing theme park sized queues going through a virtual reality system for the first time. And no one had ever really thought about the hygiene and operation style. How did you, you know, how did you summit that uh, cliff face, Simon? Well, um, yeah, I'm really glad actually you brought me in on this because the, the hygiene bit was something that we spent a huge amount of time and money looking at before back in 2016. And I commissioned a report by a, a leading uh, microbiologist. And I'll just share the sort of the conversation we had <coughs> um, before he produced his document. And the conversation from his side was, what the hell are you worried about in terms of the headsets? He said, I'm not worried about the headset. And I said, but it's something that goes on your face and your head. He said, it's irrelevant. He said, the problem's the handrail. The problem is that you stand there and hold the handrail. You go on the ride, you come off the ride, you grab a burger and you shove it in your mouth. He said, your face has got this amazing barrier. We all walk around in the world every single day. 
and we have a skin barrier you know it's the one bit of your body that's always exposed and the reason for that is because it's it's relatively safe yeah there's a few holes in it usually but um as long as you're careful about those you said it's much less of an issue so one thing i would say to everybody on this call who's involved in hygiene and headsets is the theater is absolutely as life said the theater of hygiene is very important but when it comes to what you really should be focusing on it should be the bits that people touch because it's much less likely they're going to get a problem from this area, much more likely they're going to get a problem from this, which is where they're holding it and adjusting straps or dials or whatever they're doing. That's the problem. Um, cleaning, cleaning the straps and cleaning the, the dial or whatever adjustment mechanism, that is the most important bit. This bit that has makeup and stuff on there is pretty gross sometimes, and that has to be dealt with. But that's a perception issue. It's not where the bulk of the problem lies. I'm not saying it's problem free, but really I think people, people's perception, as we found early on, was often in the wrong, it, the perception of the problem was misplaced. And so I think from an operator's perspective, clearly you need to do the right thing and follow advice of professionals on how to do the hygiene thing properly. But in terms of making your customers comfortable and happy, that's much more about um, the, the, the theatre and the process. I think the other really interesting thing that we found from that microbiology report was that a lot of the clinical wipes that are used to clean the headsets, they are, they're effective not because they're physically touching it, but because they're leaving a residue of a particular kind of chemical on there that is doing the work of destroying the germs. And often that needs a certain period of time to be effective. So if you just wipe it and put it straight on, it's completely useless. You have to be able to wipe it and leave it for a period of time, which is different depending on what kind of uh, cleaning mechanism you use. But it's then that the germs are being killed. So one thing that we're certainly looking at in the free roam um, side of things is the ability to actually swap headsets so that we can have one headsets that are being cleaned and being left to, to do their thing, whether that's in a UVC cabinet or um, you, you know, in some other way and then um, have a fresh set brought out that are used. And I think that can't work everywhere. For instance, it wouldn't work um, in certain of the theme park scenarios, but there are some areas where it can be made to work. Um, I, would, I would definitely uh, love to have a chat with, with Joe at some point about you know, hot swappable uh, Oh, no, no, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject that we're all going to be talking intimately, especially uh, as we're talking about increased throughput. We all have to ruggedize our systems. But, but time is short, uh, and uh, I know we could all uh, carry on on uh, this subject, and hopefully we'll get a chance uh, to revisit all of these points uh, in the next uh, couple of days. But Asher, uh, I'm going to throw it back to you. Are there any questions that we can handle in the time remaining? Um, I, you know, I, I really appreciated that, that last bit there, Simon. Um, I think, I guess there's one last question here, um, that someone was asking about, and we've, we've heard about clean box, I think endlessly over the last few months. Um, and someone said, you know, clean box official stance is that UVC is safe. HTC's official stance, sorry, Loretta, but this is just the question. Um, do not use um, UVC to sterilize headsets. So there's very two con contradicting official stances, one from a headset maker and one from the cleaning uh, company. And, and let, let's, let's also so, be sure that uh, um, Cleanbox is not the only provider that, that, of uh, UVC. Yeah, uh, so that was actually my other question too, was like, what other companies do you know of beyond Cleanbox that exist? Because I know there are. Um, well, we, and, we, yeah. so, I'm so sorry to cut through. I was just going to say that we have a special in the Stinger report uh, on Monday that goes through a list of about four or five of the key providers of uh, UVC systems. And let's be clear, UVC systems are to be used at the end of the day or away from the player. You do not show UVC light to uh, the guests. Oh, see, that's really good to. That's a good. That's a good thing to know about. The other thing I kind of quickly, quickly want to ask um, again, just because we're short on time, is: Does anyone um, know of any um, large-scale kind of audience research studies that have been done just to like get a temperature check of how people are feeling about coming back to? use i mean life i know you have like you know you have the data from your your um 
particular locations. But if you if you don't know of any, that's okay. I'm just curious if anyone. There's, there's one them. person that we uh, swear by at the moment, Randy White, uh, who's a specialist in uh, both uh, the retail attainment and the hospitality sector, and he's been collecting uh, data and statistics on how comfortable people feel with mm, uh, location-based yeah. entertainment at the moment. Uh, I will uh, share a link to his new service, which we also uh, push with uh, through our new service. Okay, that's great. Um, right. I'll actually, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Simon. Yeah. Sorry, I think there's also an academic study that's been done, um, which I'll try and dig out, that was done a few weeks ago about okay. people's, um, acceptance and comfort levels. So I'll try and dig that out and share it with you. Yeah, great. Actually, thank and thank you so much for that. And so, guys, any of those links or, you know, um, I, I shared kind of Hollowgate's um, standards um, document there, but I will, I'll call, collate all of those and we'll send them in a follow-up email to everyone who signed up so that you can have um, have access. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up with that. I want to say thank you so much to all of you for this. And I, I really appreciate the, the optimism. Honestly, I think it was great to hear you are the experts in this and uh, it's nice to hear such a positive, positive outlook on, on where things are going. Um, so thank you all. I hope we can continue these conversations in the coming months. This was just the first kind of post-COVID, uh, you know, topic we wanted to, to talk about, but, you know, the stuff is going to evolve and uh, hopefully we can have you back to, to talk about this stuff again. So thank you all again. I will uh, send a follow-up email. This has been recorded and it'll be available on the Immerse UK website uh, by the end of the day. So great. Thank great. you guys. Thank you for hosting. It's great Thanks. to see you all. Okay, bye. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. You too. Keep your mask you on. Too. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye.